By January 1943, the Battle of Guadalcanal was coming to an end, and the American forces knew it. Nonetheless, the 2nd Marine Division was exhausted and needed to be replaced to keep the momentum going against the Empire of Japan. A naval operation to bring reinforcements was put into place, and USS Chicago, a Northampton-class cruiser of 9,300 tons that had already survived an enemy midget submarine attack before, was to spearhead the U.S. Navy's relief effort and repel any Japanese forces in the area. On the 29th, as Chicago traversed the waters of Rinnell Island, all hell broke loose when a Japanese aircraft task force launched one of the war's first nighttime torpedo attacks. As night engulfed the sea, the Japanese pilots zeroed in on their target and launched parachute flares to pierce the darkness. Chicago's imposing silhouette led the enemy to believe she was a battleship, turning her into their main objective. The American ship then opened fire with defiance, her anti-aircraft gun smoking hot with the uninterrupted barrages. Undeterred, the Japanese kept coming. A torpedo suddenly hit Chicago, and as the crew raced to assess the damage, the second one struck the ship, causing extensive flooding. Yet, despite the dire circumstances, the wounded ship would not go down without a fight. The battle on Guadalcanal had entered its fifth month, and despite the arrival of Admiral William Halsey Jr. a month prior, whose aggressive leadership had led to a series of triumphs that finally gave them a slight advantage over the Japanese, the fight was not over yet. Meanwhile, Admiral Ernest King, the Chief of Naval Operations, was getting impatient. But with the new year dawning, Halsey was optimistic. According to him, quote, December had shown us faint signs that the tide was turning. By January, no one could doubt that it had begun to run with us. Halsey knew that for a victory in the Solomon Islands, they would need more reinforcements, additional ships and aircraft, and tons of ammunition. As the end of the month approached, American reconnaissance aircraft and radio intelligence seemingly coincided that, according to an increased activity nearby, this meant a significant Japanese naval move was imminent. So Halsey, also under pressure to relieve the 2nd Marine Division, jumped at the opportunity to combine two operations into one. He devised a strategy to safely evacuate the Marines by deploying troop transports, ensuring their protection with as much American naval power as he could gather in the South Pacific hoping this would entice the Japanese into an engagement. Admiral Halsey orchestrated a significant naval operation around Guadalcanal, dividing his forces into six groups to bolster the campaign against Japanese forces. The core of this operation included four groups equipped with a mix of battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and carriers like the Saratoga and Enterprise, prepared to counter any significant Japanese threats. Leading the advance were two other groups, one tasked with delivering reinforcements to the 2nd Marine Division on Guadalcanal and Task Force 18, commanded by Rear Admiral Giffen, an old-school by-the-book leader and a favorite of Admiral King. While not new to command, as he battled German U-boats in the Atlantic Ocean and led forces in North African waters, Task Force 18 was Ike Giffen's first action in the Pacific. Task Force 18 featured three heavy cruisers, Wichita, Louisville, and Chicago, and supporting light cruisers, destroyers, and two escort carriers for air cover. This group was charged with securing the convoy's safe passage and confronting potential Japanese opposition. On January 27th, Giffen led Task Force 18 from Afate, aiming for a strategic rendezvous near Guadalcanal on the 30th with Destroyer Squadron 21. To enhance mobility and counter submarine threats, Giffen decided to streamline his task force by detaching the slower escort carriers, Chenango and Suwani, along with two destroyers, as he hoped to increase the task force's speed. According to him, this would allow the remaining ships, including the heavy cruisers, supported by light cruisers and destroyers, to move more swiftly and maintain a lighter formation for anti-submarine defense. While appropriate for the Atlantic, this formation left the ships open to air attack, the predominant method of Japanese assault in the Pacific. On January 29th, with the cruiser's rear sections vulnerable due to the destroyers positioned in front and lacking clear instructions for countering air assaults, Task Force 18, or what was left of it, proceeded forward. That afternoon, radar screens aboard some of the ships registered unidentified aircraft nearby. Fighters took off from their carriers to search the skies, all while following Giffen's order for radio silence, but they returned after failing to find anything. Never expecting the Japanese would ever attack after dark, as they'd never done it before, 
Giffen declined to send up another combat air patrol to take advantage of the last few moments of remaining daylight. As night fell, Task Force 18 found itself without fighter cover, navigating in a zigzag pattern northwest toward the meeting point at a speed of 24 knots, just north of Rennell Island. Within this setup, Wichita, Chicago, and their sister ship Louisville closely followed, constituting the central element of the formation. In command of Chicago was Captain Ralph Davis, who was busy directing radar searches with all four single-mounted 5-inch guns, anti-aircraft batteries manned, and its nine 8-inch guns in three turrets on standby. At 7.10 p.m., the heavy cruiser's radar suddenly contacted unidentified aircraft, making a circle and approaching the rear of Task Force 18, only 25 miles away. According to one sailor, the radar looked like, quote, a disturbed hornet's nest. This was a 32 Mitsubishi G4M Betty bomber unit, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Joji Higai, that was about to launch one of World War II's first ever nighttime torpedo attacks. Approaching the Americans from the inky blackness, Higai split the aircraft into two groups and charged in. The Lieutenant Commander's first wave was brief and failed, as the zigzagging allowed the United States Navy ships to evade the attack and ended with a Betty shot down near Chicago and a second that missed its mark and then was swallowed by the darkness. Assuming the attack was finished and pressed for time to meet his rendezvous orders, Commander Giffen halted the ship's zigzagging and commanded the task force to resume on a straight course to increase the speed. But round two was about to begin and the Japanese were looking to capitalize on this mistake. Pilot Higai personally led the second group of Bettys from the east, this time with the help of scout aircraft that dropped flare parachutes. Now, Brightly illuminated against the black backdrop of the Pacific Ocean and steaming in a straight course, Task Force 18 was the perfect target. The aviators focused on the cruiser column, particularly Chicago, which the Japanese had mistaken for a battleship. With this, all hell broke loose as aircraft after aircraft came after her. Luck at first shielded the Americans from harm, as the ships had some of the latest in technology, proximity Mark 32 shell fuses, which automatically exploded whenever the shell came near an aircraft and took down several enemy units. Now determined to achieve one win, at 7.38 p.m., Higai charged his Betty through thick anti-aircraft fire toward a ship, but an American shell burst near him. With this, the famed pilot's Betty then plummeted to the Pacific, crashing off Chicago's port bow. Four minutes later, the Japanese retaliated, sending two torpedoes that plowed right into Chicago and stopping her dead in the water. The first torpedo strike on the USS Chicago immediately caused a loss of control, flooding the engine and fire room compartments, leading to a starboard list and power loss. The second hit only made it worse. Chicago was immobile and vulnerable, but the crew was implacable. Only six months before, at Savo Island, she'd suffered torpedo damage, and the sailors and Captain Davis immediately sprang into action. They were hoping to save their heavy cruiser once more. After Admiral Giffen was notified about Chicago, under the cover of darkness, he changed course and slowed the task force to make it difficult for the Japanese pilots to spot their water trails. He also prohibited anti-aircraft fire, unless directed at a definite target. Now, the main focus of the task force switched to saving Chicago. Sister ship Louisville positioned herself to tow Chicago, and with the ship still facing an uncertain fate, under the persistent threat of enemy forces, the task force sailed into the night, hoping to reach Espiritu Santo for repairs. To provide some air cover, escort carriers Chenango and Swanee moved closer, and a group centered on the carrier Enterprise was ordered to steam toward the stricken cruiser. But despite these moves, the Japanese air fleet would not let the damaged cruiser get away. At 3.40 p.m. the following afternoon, a single Japanese aircraft north of Rennell Island was seen approaching the task force at high altitude. It was a spotter sent in before the main attack formation to guide it toward the target. Flying at full throttle toward the Betty, four American Wildcats made it spiral toward the sea. But it was too late, and minutes later, 12 bombers were heading directly toward the carrier Enterprise. With this, as the ship increased speed, the anti-aircraft guns were pointed at the sky, and other vessels formed a protective shield around her. With the Japanese inching closer by the second, Ten additional fighters prepared to take off with open guns to welcome the attackers. However, only 17 miles away, the bombers made a sharp turn. 
They were now headed directly to the already stricken and less protected Chicago. The sudden change of direction made it nearly impossible for the carrier aircraft to close in on the enemy. Two American fighters assigned to protect Chicago quickly flew into the fray, heading directly into the line of American anti-aircraft fire. They pursued the Japanese aircraft, managing to shoot one down successfully. By then, however, the Japanese entered their final run-in. With the cruisers too far away to intervene, Chicago's life now depended upon the six nearby destroyers. One, Lavalette, stood squarely between the Bettys and the cruiser, opening a furious fire upon the enemy. Combined, her and USS Chicago's anti-aircraft batteries successfully shot down six Japanese bombers. However, one torpedo ripped into Lavalette's forward engine, making her steam out of the battle area. Navajo, another destroyer, then started aligning Chicago's bow with the direction of the attack to make her a smaller target. But just when it seemed like the attack was over, lookouts aboard the stricken ship spotted five more torpedo water trails heading toward the cruiser. Precisely at 4.24 p.m., while traveling at the agonizingly slow speed of four knots, the entire cruiser shuddered from the blasts of four successive torpedoes tearing into her starboard side. One struck forward, showering the bridge and deck with debris, while the three others tore right into the middle of the cruiser, ripping it apart and creating a raging inferno. Immediately listing to starboard as more and more water poured in, Captain Davis knew the situation was both hopeless and critical. He issued the command to cut the tow line and to abandon ship. The crew sprang into action, and life rafts were hurled into the ocean, a task made all the more difficult by Chicago's severe tilt. Only 19 minutes after the first torpedo hit, at 4.43 p.m. on January 30th, 1943, USS Chicago's bow disappeared below the water of the Pacific Ocean. According to radio technician John Irby, watching the ship become a memory was, quote, like watching someone I've known and loved go down under the waves. Following this, ships like Edwards, Waller, Sands, and Navajo picked 1,049 survivors from the water, but 60 crew members were not as lucky. While the Battle of Rennell Island was not one of the war's conclusive encounters in the Pacific, it came at a time when American forces appeared to have momentum in the Solomons. Any setback, like the loss of a heavy cruiser, was seen as a threat to the success of the war effort. Following the attack, Giffen's superiors were irate. But especially furious was Halsey, who knew that he needed every Marine, every aircraft, and every ship if he wanted to take the Solomons. Still, with the enemy's attention focused on Task Force 18, the transports landed the marine replacements on Guadalcanal without any significant interference. With this, the battle for Guadalcanal would continue, and soon, victories would become much more common. Before the Battle of Rinal Island, the Americans believed that a Japanese attack was imminent. Yet this could not be further from the truth. The increased activity noticed towards the end of January 1943 was instead tied to the evacuation of Japanese forces from Guadalcanal, known as Operation K which the Empire executed successfully under cover of night, and with the Americans focusing all their time and resources on Task Force 18. This misunderstanding of Japanese intentions highlights the challenges of wartime intelligence and the complexities of interpreting enemy movements. The successful evacuation of Japanese forces from Guadalcanal in early February 1943 effectively ended their campaign on the island, securing it as a significant strategic victory for the Allies in the Pacific Theater.